OK, it looks like starting now we're live. Uh, welcome everybody to tonight's show of Profound States. Uh, tonight we have Kimmy. She calls herself Quantum Kimmy, but uh, we'll just call her Kimmy. Um, she has uh, always had an interest in the supernatural and spent many years studying different forms of meditation and energy work. Her spiritual journey expanded greatly after she lost a loved one to suicide and was visited by him during an outer, outer, body, outer body experience. Uh, Kimmy experienced a powerful Kundalini awakening, which led her to led to her creating her YouTube channel, Quantum Kimmy, where she shares her supernatural experiences and how to ignite them for yourself. She has recent she has recently uploaded interviews with various near death experiencers and her new series called Back to the Source. Uh, welcome to tonight's show a Profound States or episode of Profound States. Quantum Kimmy, how are you doing today? Hey, thank you, Mike. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, let me get rid of, put your bio down and make you bigger. All right, so um, uh, with uh, being as you have uh, uh, had a Kundalini awakening, and that's kind of rare, I think uh, near-death experiences are far more common, uh, at least you know, given uh, Jeff Mars podcast, it seems like a lot of people have heard a lot of people's near death experiences recently. But you even with that, you rarely hear of people's Kundalini experiences. I know one of the ladies or one of the people who interviewed me, uh, a lady had had her Kundalini uh, uh, awaken, but Aside from her, I can't think of any other people who've had that happen. Uh, why don't we start? Well, let, before we get into that, um, can, is there anything in your childhood? Um, what is the very first strange? When I say strange, it could be paranormal, aliens, anything that's out of that us humans consider out of the ordinary that happened to you at a young age is there anything like that in your background um well i was raised in uh, a christian cult so i was really set up um, to have a they were a very spiritual group i don't know if you've heard of the moonies uh i have definitely heard of young sung moon yeah Sun Young Moon. Sun Young Moon, I'm sorry. Sun Young uh, yeah. Moon. Yeah, I grew up, grew up in, a, in a cult, so it was, uh, they were very, very spiritual. It was a good foundation for me. They, were, they had good morals. Um, you know, it was, it was just very controlling and fear-based. Uh, weird thing, though, let's see. Um, you know what? I was uh, actually struck by lightning when I was 11. Uh, I was sitting directly? It, it hit you directly. Well, yeah, sort of. I was, I, was, I was at my bedroom window. And um, leaning against the windowsill, and I used to love looking at thunderstorms and rain, and uh, this bolt of lightning came from my left side and hit my arm, I went flying back across the room. My brother was there, he witnessed it, and um, I was fine after that, but that year and the following four years of middle school, I became <laughs> athlete of the year. I was uh, the fastest runner in the school for four years. <laughs> But the lightning hits you directly. Where did on your body did it hit? Right here, right on my okay. forearm. And it knocked you. It knocked you down. I went flying across the room, landed on the bed, and I didn't have any burn, no pain, nothing. I just put together years later, maybe 10, 10 15 years later, that that I had become. A, an extremely good athlete for about four years and i'm like maybe it was the lightning well so. do people say you have a magnetic personality now <laughs> <laughs> i personally think it it helped me with my my kundalini awakening it's it was kind of the you know that's a cosmic voltage that your body receives and you know i was i did get electrocuted a lot after that and um you know maybe it was just reflecting back you know maybe it was just uh something that 
kind of pre prepared me for the experience that and many other things but so that, what happened between the time you were struck what of any anything strange happened between that how old were you when that happened 11. okay what happened did anything strange happen between the age of 11 that was unusual and your kundalini experience what else happened yeah so i used to wake up um on um, sleep paralysis when i was about started about 13 maybe sooner and you know just waking up paralyzed and uh, terrified um, and I used to have extremely vivid dreams. I don't know what if they were astral projections or what, but um, I started to leave my body ugh, in late teens, early 20s. And um, they were just brief moments of just, you know, leaving my body and uh, encounters with, uh, usually they were scary beings, demonic beings. Um, in my later 20s, it became much more intense. Um, and yeah, I studied, I studied, st I started to play with energy work when I was in my mid 20s. I, I discovered, I read about Reiki when I was in my teens. And then I was like, one day I'm going to learn how to do that. And I was broke. So I didn't, you know, didn't have the money to go to a course, but I, I just decided I was going to attune myself so i would just keep asking i don't know the universe to to attune me to this energy and you know with time i started to feel something happening um and it wasn't until i connected with this person who was like i don't know it's zimbabwe or timbuktu i don't even know so on the other side of the world he was offering free distant uh reiki attunements and he said just pick a time i was like okay 9 a.m on monday and he's like, okay, it's done. I already did it. Um, it's in the fields. You're gonna, it's gonna happen on Monday at nine. And lo and behold, Monday at nine a.m., I, I was in a dream, and uh, I was dreaming that my brother was, I was play fighting with him, and he came up to me, right up to my chest, and started punching me in the chest over and over again. I woke up, and the sensation is happening still. I'm awake, but there's this punching sensation in my chest. I look over at the clock. It's nine a.m. <laughs> on Monday. I thought I'd be awake by then, but I wasn't. And um, that began uh, my journey of energy, feeling energy all the time and downloading energy. And then. Um, um, go back, go back to back up a little bit. Uh, do you mind going through your um, inner in, uh, encounters with the demons? Yeah, so. Um, it was most it was mostly like a sexual type of assault type of thing. They would uh, rip me out of my body when I was um, early in the morning. It was grog groggy, and I didn't know what was going on. And um, yeah, I don't want to get too graphic, but they would put me in positions that were just un like they couldn't do that uh, as a as a human, as a 3D human. Just weird stuff, upside down. And, so um, yeah, it was violating. So you were molested by demons. Yeah, yeah, it was awful. And um, I, you're not the, you know, it, you're. I know that it's uh, hard for you to talk about that. It must be, but um, you're not. Uh, how do I put this? Uh, you're not the only one. That many people have gone through similar experiences. You, I guess, you know that by now, right? I do know that. Yeah, I know that. Um, they came in when you know sporadic it was like it wasn't like every night it was like you know a few times a year it wasn't until i started doing energy work that it got more um vivid and intense and um you know sometimes they would take the form of, of a family member so, so you know i started to learn they feed off the emotions of disgust and um it wasn't until six years or five years ago after my kundalini awakening that i was able to control all of this and um you know i had met my fiance and uh i oh, was oh, sorry. stop stop for a second okay yeah. um back up um um how do i put this i'm i consider myself to be an expert on demons 
when I say an expert on demons, I don't mean a demonologist uh, who knows the names of all the demons. I'm sort of like you. I'm, um, I've had my own dealings with them directly. Um, I've had two, uh, I've had two demonic attaching spirits attached to me since I was 16, I'm 61. So uh, if you take uh, 16, subtract it from 61, that's what, 45? So I've had uh, demon, two demons attached to me for 45 years to my body. So uh, that means that I've had uh, demonic experiences continuously for 45 years, every single moment of every single day. So it's, I, I, I'm sort of more of an expert than you are even. <laughs> probably, yeah, yeah, probably. So, um, but it's not something I necessarily am proud of. It just, it is the way it is. So um, it is what it is, I should say. So um, I want, like to back up and have you, um, if you're okay with it, describe what, um, I don't necessarily need you to describe what happened because uh, I know you, you have our time going through that verbally. Anybody would, but I would like to know what, at a minimum, I would like to know what the very first one looked like. And uh, I would also like to know, you know, how many different ones there were or what each one looked like. Uh, you know, you don't have to get graphic on what they did, but I, I think it would be good to know as many details about them uh, um, uh, as possible, if, if as much as you're willing to to go through to to go yeah, through. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I think I I can't say that there was um, one in particular that stands out as a regular um, because they always had disguises. Uh, the first time that I remember that I recall, I don't know, a full-on conscious experience, I was in my 20s. Um, I, I could see my room. It pulled me out of my room, and I couldn't see it. It was like I had a form of it in my mind, um, even, though, even though it was <clears throat> suspending me in the air and stuff, and I could see. It, I could feel that it was physically there. I didn't, I didn't see it, but in my mind I could see it. I had a thought about what it looked like, and it was a orangey red type of a demonic looking, like the typical horned looking thing, right? Um, right. Um, okay. So yeah. hold on for hold on for a second. So, so uh, let me let me put myself back in here. Hold on a second. All right. So, so. Um, so let me think about this for a second. So, um, when there is some details I'd like about your experiences, not necessarily what we know they molest you. That's, that's already a given. I don't need to know that, but I would like to know the nature of the encounter as in, uh, were you, uh, when it happened, were you meditating, sleeping, awake? Uh, um, uh, were you in the astral plane, uh, you know, out of your body uh, as you're dreaming, but it's not really a dream because you're really, you know, I need to know, or not I, the audience yeah. the, would like to know. I know they want to know uh, the, 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 circumstances under which these things occurred. Were you sleeping in your bed and they raped you in your bed? Were you walking down the street? Were you dreaming? You know, things like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, I'll get very specific. So I had been uh, meditating at this temple, learning a lot about absorbing energy. I didn't know at the time, but when you're when you absorb a lot of universal energy, that's that charges your, your astral body, right? So um, even though I had, I had had out of our experiences before, you know, I had so much more juice and charge in my body that that's why these became more vivid. So I was, uh, usually it would happen if I had meditated a lot that day, then I would go to sleep. Um, and it would usually happen early in the morning around 5 a.m. 
And I had I had learned this practice to like draw energy into my body. So I would imagine energy going up my legs and then storing inside my root chakra, my first energy center. And I would do that hundreds of times before going to bed and I'd fall asleep. And um, this so, particular time. Hold on for a second. So the 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 practice that you're talking about, uh, is it something you learned within the church? No, that particular one I had learned from this guy called uh, Robert Bruce. Yes, one of the out of body people. Yeah, he he, he wrote this book called. Um, so, so um, here, here's here's another question. Um, um, all right, so how do I put this? Do you think that I interviewed a fellow recently? who has a book and he promotes astral travel. And he stated uh, very clearly that he believed that when you went astral traveling, he, he, uh, his personal belief was that in the astral plane, you're actually closer to the creator than when you're in your body. He considered it to be a, uh, a divine or or a step towards being near the creator. I'm not saying he's correct. I'm also not denying he's correct. I don't really know one way or the other. But do you see a um, a, a positive? I, I've heard, you know, there are rumors. On the astral plane, you have uh, hellish worlds. You have world, he heaven type worlds within the astral plane whether it's the lower astral plane, the upper astral plane, you hear rumors about these things. But if if you're not an actual astral traveler, it's just something you might believe in or not. Um, A, are you an astral traveler? B, do you believe that the astral plane is closer to God? C, okay, here's another one. Before you even answer it a lot, here's another step, please, piece of it. Okay, I, when I worked, at, do you remember... Um, by any chance, do you remember compact computers? Yeah. You do? Uh, but before HP bought them, you remember them? Yeah, yeah, I remember. Okay. okay, so I used to work there. And my boss there, he learned uh, astral traveling from somebody. He wouldn't tell me who it was he learned from, but he, he found a technique. He said it was very easy for him to astral travel, get out of his body and go to the astral plane. He said he did that a lot until he touched a demon. And I, I said to him, what did the demon look? This is a coworker, right? He's my boss. And I said, what did the demon look like? He said, I never saw the demon. I just touched it. He said, when I touched it, I, I got its, a, its consciousness inside of me. I knew uh, everything about it. It was a demon and blah, blah, blah. And he didn't really go into much detail. But he said he never got out. He never went astral traveling out of his body after that. And oh, so having said all of that, I'm not trying to make this show about me at all. I'm just pre pre uh, queuing my question so that you have a, a good base to respond to. So you go right ahead and speak about uh, the oh, demons, the astral plane, anything else you think fits into the answer. Well, there's different levels to the astral plane, right? So when, as soon as you leave, you know, and, and you're in that first level, it's it, you're you have access to um, it's so close to the lower dimension, right? So that's that's and because it's a thought realm, your subconscious thoughts that are most have the most weight are going to manifest first so demons you know fears fears will manifest as a as a demon you know i i'm not going to say you know 100 that these beings i encountered were actual beings because in the thought realm we collectively as a group create these beings um i believe i believe we have our own personal ones that we create and then i believe there's collective ones you know that we create because it's all thought realm. So whatever you think comes to be in that in that realm. 
Um, are you closer to God? That depends on your vibration, right? So, you know, I've, I have, tr there have been times where I have met higher beings, um, but, you know, those beings are, are difficult to, in my experience, um, get in contact with all the time if, if your vibration isn't high enough, right? Um, at, the, at, by, at the same time, you know, if you're not, if you don't have the perception, if you're not able to perceive higher beings, they might appear to you as something gray and scary looking, right? Because you're not, you don't have that development yet. So uh, I learned with time that um, these beings, uh, when I was, when, when I first acknowledged them as the possibility of being my own creation, that is when I started to have more control over what was happening. And um, it wasn't until my Kundalini awakening where I had much more energy, much more conscious uh, presence. Because in, in the astral plane, a lot of the time I was on autopilot and I couldn't control it. And I was, it was like the, a very, it was a powerful lucid dream, if that's where, as far as it would go. But um, after my Kundalini awakening, I was able to be very focused and um, present. And um, um, do, you, I, I was, do you do you remember? Oh, okay, let me let me put myself back in. Hold on. Okay, so um, do you remember the very first time you astral traveled? The the, the very first time. The first time I actually was able to exit my body because I, I had glimpses of it in my teens, but I didn't actually fully leave my body till I was around twenty six. And I was upstairs in my room, falling asleep, and I suddenly felt like I was in a rocking chair. Rocking, 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 and suddenly it was like this overwhelming feeling like I must fall completely back. So I, I let, I surrendered and allowed myself to fall completely back. And then I would, fell through the mattress and I was out of my body. And I was like uh, in the living room at that point, and my dad was downstairs and I could see him watching TV and then... Boom, I was back in my body. And that was the first time where I was like, holy. So so the the first time was very short. Very short. Yeah. Yeah. They were always all short. They never they never became long until after like I said, after my Kundalini awakening, my body was my astral body was so charged that I it was like gas for the astral body. So depending on how much I had meditated, how much I had absorbed energy, I could stay in the astral plane for you know for their relative amount of time so so yeah that that came definitely after the kundalini awakening so uh, um this is, so um did you work to get out of your body uh before you had your first astral experience did it just happen or did you work did you do things to get that to that level yeah so um I had read about techniques and things um, that you could these like rolling out and just pretending you're climbing a rope and um, all these different techniques. Um, I and in the beginning I would uh, usually roll out and it would be I, I, would, I would be groggy and I would roll out. And I could you could I could literally hear and feel the clunk on the floor after I would come out of my bed. Other times I would sink right through my bed. Um, but uh, after my Kundalini awakening, it was um, it was just automatic. I would hear the vibration. I would hear the frequency of my astral body rising, and I could control it. I could make it go to the extreme, and then I could I could I would just either just catapult out of my body, or I could choose to stay in my body. And when I chose to stay in my body was when I my um, Asked my psychic hearing would go through the roof, and then I would usually receive some kind of an audio message or contact with a past loved one or something. Um, it's, it's, I've almost had more interesting experiences in my body <laughs> in that high vibration than actually exiting it. Um, but exiting is absolutely effortless now. So, when you before you had your first what how old were you when you had your first astral experience or out of body experience 
full on was probably in my mid 20s, but like I had sleep paralysis throughout my teens. So just waking up paralyzed and being completely aware of the room, but not actually able to leave the body. Yeah. Uh, so. Um... Do you want to hear how I got rid of the demons? <laughs> Did you get, did you get rid of them? Yeah. Completely. So, yep. Okay, so hold on before you get into that. Uh, first of all, what age were you when the very first time you had a demonic uh, attack? How old were you at that at that time? Somewhere in my teens, I would say. Your teens. And yeah. when and what age were you when you had your first astral experience? Well, full body, I think it was like 26. 26. OK, yeah. so did do you learn how to get rid of the demons after your Kundalini experience or before? After. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so let's do this in, in uh, some type of chronological order so it's not too confusing. So go through. Um, well, before we even get into the, your Kundalini, uh, let's step back just for a second. And uh, what, uh, again, okay, so you were saying that you were pulling energy up from the ground into your body and doing that experience before you had your first astral experience, correct? Was that, did I have that right? Uh, yeah, I would say around that time, yeah, I was doing this practice of like just pulling energy from everywhere, not just not the ground. I would do it while I was sleeping and I would just imagine big balls of energy going up my legs and then storing them in my root chakra. And so, if I had done that enough, I'd have a spontaneous outer body experience that night. So you, do, you, do you consider that energy work just energy work in general or did you consider it Kung Fu or Qi Kung or Tai Chi or did you give it a, the energy work you did? Did you do you? Did you and do no, you call it something? I didn't call it anything. I was doing it. Oh, the, I don't know the reason why I was doing it. I was I was just trying to fill my body with energy. I was fascinated with energy work and I wanted my chakras to yeah, activate. I was fascinated with activating my chakras and I learned that if you had stored energy into your first chakra, it would eventually spill over to the other ones. So I didn't focus on any of the other ones. I just focused on that first one and really tried to fill it with energy hundreds and hundreds of times before going to sleep. I would do that. And, uh, so so you're talking about when you say the first chakra, you're talking about the root chakra that's at the base yeah. of your spine where yeah. your Kundalini is supposed to sit, right? Right. Yeah. OK. All right, now I now I've got some con we've got some context. Uh, <laughs> you're filling the same chakra where the kundalini is supposed to be coiled at, so okay. that gives us some some context. Now let's move forward to uh, let's go to the what was happening to you just prior to your kundalini awakening. What were you doing? What practice, if any kind? spiritual practice or energy practice or any kind of practice you were doing yeah. just prior to I your was doing a few things um you know just yeah i i got good at moving energy in my body you could call it qigong but it was it wasn't just a visual visual thing i could feel it i could feel energy moving in my body i would put my awareness at the base of my foot and i could move it and stimulate it with my mind and i just got really good at i wouldn't sleep right away i was got really good at just moving energy through my body and absorbing energy in my body. But um, I had been going to this temple where we um, we would take a week or two weeks at a time and meditate eight hours a day, sitting or standing, mostly standing. Um, and the whole point of these retreats were we would do different hand positions, mudras as they call it, chanting, um, all sorts of uh, visualizations to draw energy into the body. And it was all for self-healing healing, physical, emotional traumas. And uh, it was during um, one of those retreats, I started to see lights with my eyes closed, spinning, green and purple lights. Um, but I wasn't an avid meditator, okay? I would go to these retreats about a week, two weeks, and then, you know, do 
with my whole heart and soul, and then I would kind of take a break. And um, what what happened was I had discovered the work of Dr. Joe Dispenza. Uh, my sister had been harassing me to, to, to research him, and, you know, I was kind of lax with my spiritual practice, but, you know, he, he just kept showing up, and I uh, watched one of his videos on YouTube, and then my my boyfriend saw it too and he was like wow like this guy's amazing like let's buy his course so we bought his course it's a it's a nine week online course and uh we finished it in a week like we watched every lecture just like all day long and uh, i think it was maybe the sixth seventh module i had uh dr joe talks about he talks about raising your kundalini even though he doesn't mention the word kundalini he calls it liberating energy so if you think, look at your bottom three chakras, they govern, they help us process um, these, these lower type of vibrations. So like sexual desires, uh, they help us process stress, uh, digesting food. Um, there's a lot of energy to process um, an orgasm, uh, you know, giving life to a baby, right? So all this energy that we use in our lower centers, he teaches to raise it to the higher centers and open up um, the, the heart, the throat, the third eye and the crown. And when you, when you open up those chakras and you operate life through those centers, um, you're a much more loving person. You feel connected more to the world. You know, you're just, you're just a, a more developed human. So um, he had been teaching this meditation where you do deep breathing and you try to put all your focus on your heart center and you try to visualize a future that's very grand. And um, my brother had just called me that day and he was, he just lost his business. He was on the brink of losing it all. He was very depressed. He was suicidal. And he begged me for some help. And I said, oh, my God, you know, I just came across this Dr. Joe stuff. You should try it. And I talked him through this breathing and imagining a better future. And he got so into it that he suddenly felt this explosion within him. This energy rose above, uh, up through his body and out his arms and his hands. And his hands were cl closed tight because the energy was so powerful. And he started to scream at me like, oh, my God, like, is this safe? Like, what's happening to me? And I said, this is this is what Dr. Joe's been talking about. And um, he just was so, he felt so incredible. And he felt like he was alive again. And he, he, like there was literally like electricity coming out of his hands. So after that phone call, I, I was just about to sit down and do this meditation with Dr. Joe. I had this euphoric feeling for my brother. I was like, wow, what just happened? And I closed my eyes to go into this meditation. My boyfriend was next to me, and um, I could already start to see, like, these lights flickering um, behind my eyes. And Dr. Joe's got us to start doing some deep breathing to this really emotional music. And it was um, the kind of music that will start to make you want to cry. And um, he's got us to focus on our energy and our heart and start breathing. And something about the music started to make me feel emotional. And then he said to think of a future. And I don't know, I just thought, what if I won the lottery? And I thought about my sister telling her the news and it was the expression on her face that just triggered this emotion in me. And my heart just exploded. It's like, like a cork popped out. And um, this energy just erupted through my entire body. Um, I saw insane light explosions and um, my hands started to curl because the energy was just so intense. My feet were curled. And I could feel like these explosions, like an orgasm in my heart, and it was just exploding in waves. <laughs> and my boyfriend was next to me just wondering what the heck was going on. And I, I had to just block him out and not feel self-conscious and just try to absorb what was happening to me in this moment. And um, yeah, this explosion just kept on going, going for about 30 minutes, just this feeling of absolute connection to everything and feeling that God was really uh, focused on me that moment and really loved me and I felt love for everything and everyone. 
And then there, after that started a process of my body trying to integrate this high voltage of cosmic energy that was just exploding through me for weeks and months. And um, it was really hard. I had, to diff- I had a very difficult time trying to integrate the energy because it was so um, powerful. So I had quite a few uh, um, symptoms or, you know, I call them healing reactions, I would say. Lots of detoxing, lots of vomiting, lots of um, just headaches and all sorts of pain, but um, and energy, just masses of energy forming in my heart and just feeling like pure energy, like I thought I was going to explode. Um, but it settled down eventually, and now I just I feel this current inside my body. It, at the, it starts at the base of my spine. It shoots down my legs. It goes up my spine. It goes up my hands, and it's there all the time. And I can I can move it. I can move it into other people. I can move it into my boyfriend when we're sleeping, and he'll start to bounce off the bed and while he's sleeping. And it's uh, it's really really cool. Um, so. Um, this started to make my astral projections a lot more intense, and I was able I was able to go deep into space. I was able to go deep into the Earth. I was able to fly across the planet at super speeds, um, but and and meet some higher beings. But every now and then, there would be an entity, a demon. He would come into the room, and he would I could hear his demonic laugh. It's like ho 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 right in my ear and he would try to pull me out of my body and i would resist him because i had strength now i would resist i would resist and um there was a period of time and it was a new in our relationship and you know he knew all this stuff about me but it was starting to get to a point where i felt so bad because i was waking him up every single night screaming because this demon was trying to pull me out of my body. And this particular demon, I could only hear him and feel him. I could not see him. I could not even perceive him in my thoughts. Um, But just hearing him was so um, intense, such an intense feeling of fear because the auditory phenomenon was so physical. Um, And it got to a point one night where I was so fed up I did not want to disturb, like we were in a new relationship, I didn't want him to leave me, you know, I was like, I got to do something about this, I can't wake him up another night, and what I did was I surrendered, and I said, take me, I'm not afraid, do whatever you want to do with me, and I, this feeling of surrender where I just allowed it to pull me, and it pulled me out, and I just said, whatever you want to do, you do, and at that moment, it's like uh, this feeling that I got from this being, it was like respect and it laughed and retreated. <laughs> this demonic laugh, like, oh, 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 oh. and it, it was like, it, it respected me. It's like I passed the test or something and then it never came back after that. And uh, yeah, that's how I stopped the demon attacks. I completely surrendered to it and had no fear. That's an amazing story. <laughs> now that's not to say that I don't still have encounters. They just um, there are there are other beings that do try to scare me, um, and they do k- kind of catch me off guard here, here and there. But no one can touch me now. Like they don't, no one can violate me. So you, um, okay. Just a, I yeah. guess the next question I have is, in your you're forty four, right? Okay. You do look a lot younger than 44, by the way. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> uh, so your skin is radiant. It's, uh, yeah. Okay. So um, let me, how do I put this? Uh, the easiest way to ask the question is just to ask it directly. So how many demons would you say ballpark have you encountered directly in your 44 years? Dozen. How many? About a dozen. Dozen. Okay. And I say why the number is um, a little bit higher than I. How do I explain this? I do. Uh, I don't do this for people, but for my family, 
I, I don't know how I came across doing this, but I have this ability where I can connect with someone and I can cast their demons and their demons literally go through my body and I will war with them for an hour or so or two until they're grabbing my pinky toe and, and until they will let go and I will cast them out of me. And um, yeah, I don't know how I, uh, I came across that gift, but it's... So it's, you, it's, you did, did you or did you not just tell us that you pull them out of other people fight pull them into your body you fight with them and then you cast them out of your body is that what you just said i just want to make sure i got uh, this story. yeah i didn't i don't do it consciously i was just i was one day i was connecting with a, a family member and i was i i, I work a lot with angels uh, uh, archangel michael the most and he i guess guided me to do this and i i would i would just ask for them to release whatever is holding them back and um as I was praying for this person, something would go through me that was so disgusting and heavy and gross. And like, um, I could, I don't know, I just know it's a demon, I guess. And um, I would just pray and just pray for about an hour sometimes to just have this entity leave this person. And I don't know why it has to go through my body. That's not how I ever intended it to go, but that is unfortunately how it does go. And um, yes, I there's been a good handful of times where I've done this for family members. Um, it's not fun. Every time I do it, I regret it. Uh, but I end up, it, it's kind of like I wake up in a state in the middle of the night and something takes over me and compels me to do this healing for them. Um, it's, a, it's like a higher state trance trance state um, and thoughts just kind of control me and tell me what to do and then it happens so yeah it's uh so so um okay <laughs> i've never shared that publicly. so you've given me a lot to think about so you um say that since your kundalini awakened you when it awakened you had you described it perfectly in the sense that um, from everything I've read about it, it's a, a fairly dangerous uh, yes. thing to do. When I say dangerous, I don't mean dangerous as in it's going to kill you. Uh, it could kill you. I, I guess I should say that, but um, yeah. I don't I don't mean dangerous as in it could kill you. What I mean dangerous as in you don't have while you're in the bo human body, you don't have control over it until you do gain control over it or until it settles down. So uh, from what I hear, uh, uh, there's a guy, I watched his video recently, and he's, he was talking about Kundalini Awakening the whole, the whole show. He's giving a class on Kundalini Awakening. And uh, he said, one of the things he said that really stood out was that um, that part of the big practice for um, for getting the Kundalini to awaken is to uh, prepare for it so that when it does awaken, it doesn't like blow your mind and cause you to go insane or yeah. kill you or any yeah. other uh, thing that you can't control. You're not totally out of control. That somehow uh, an almost uncontrollable phenomenon is controlled by you in some fashion. So uh, when it awakened in you, how old were you again? Oh, I didn't know, maybe 39, 40? Thirty-nine. Okay. And how long did it take for you to gain control over it? Approximately. I'd say three months. Three months. Wow, that's not much time. So when um Joe Dispenza had you um, focusing on your heart, so it awakened, it came up to your heart, and it was flowing out of your heart chakra. Is that accurate? Yeah, so raising the Kundalini, first of all, yeah, you want to create the circuitry along your spine. You want to be able to absorb energy and get your body used to the voltage, right? And the more you prepare your body, the easier the transition is going to be. So. You know, it's it's not going to be such a shock to the system to have all this cosmic energy go through your body. 
if you've done the work to prepare for it. So for me, I inadvertently was preparing for this my whole life, I guess, um, starting with the lightning bolt. Um, but, you know, I still wasn't fully ready for, for the energy. Um, and, uh, but if you do want to ignite it in my, uh, I've ignited it three full times. And each time it was the same formula. There was a physical movement, so a physical aspect. I was deep, breathing deeply. And Dr. Joe teaches this breath called the supernatural breath. And in that breath, you squeeze your, your sexual organs as you're doing this deep breathing. And you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to move your cerebral spinal fluid up your spine. And this, this fluid is, um, is charged. Um, and uh, with this movement, when it hits your pineal gland, it activates this electricity and um, it create it turns your pineal gland into a transducer so it can perceive other you know higher higher density information so um you've got to be doing something physical so either breathing squeezing yoga whatever something physical the second thing you need is something emotional and the heart seems to be kind of like this accelerator like once the block is removed there it's like that energy is going to go up once you've cleared whatsoever whatever's in here if that kundalini energy reaches there if you can open that it's going to just go all the way so um activating the heart through any kind of emotion so even if it's like despair you know i sometimes encourage people to think about their worst memory one that's really going to just make them cry trigger some tears because I, the three times I raised my kundalini, I was bawling and um, just crying with, you know, joy or thinking about, you know, the worst thing that ever happened to me. And it's just, it's just any emotion to ignite it. And then imagining using the third thing, which is imagining a grand future, something that, you know, for me it was the lottery, and um, you know, just imagining an outcome that's so grand that it just blows your mind. And from there, those Combining those three things, I believe, is what ignites it. Um, and then, you know, there's a bunch of other things you can do to prepare. Tell, tell us the three things again. What are the three things? So you want to do something physical, so breathing, something with your body. You know, breathing, chanting, you know, doing the squeezing that Dr. Joe teaches. Um, you know, some people have ignited it doing yoga, right? Um, and then so that's something physical, emotional, so feeling something in your heart and putting focus on your heart, putting all your awareness in your heart and just um, it, the, 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 the second and third thing kind of it, it all has to go simultaneously. Right. So you're thinking the thought triggers the feeling. Right. So you want to have a thought that's going to trigger the emotion and you can start as a, at a low at a low emotion. You can start at despair and then move your way up. Um, so, in my experience, that's how how it triggers. But I will say, if you have done the work, you know, it's, imagine a scale, and each time you meditate, the scales are tipping. And one night, you might have done that final meditation, gone to bed, and it happens while you're sleeping. I know someone who it happened to them while they were sleeping. Uh, okay, so it's. Uh... Something with your body, some uh, an emotion, and what was the third thing after your body and emotion? It's a, it's a thought. The thought triggers the emotion, right? So you have to be thinking about something super grand, so that your so it will open your heart, right? You've got to move this block here in the heart, right? So a lot of people will there. There are instances where people have been listening to really uplifting music and dancing and breathing and you know they're just feeling amazing they're dancing and moving this you know and and suddenly it, the kundalini will explode that's a spontaneous you know reaction so so and uh, well i know someone it happened to during during intercourse they were squeezing and breathing and feeling love for this person and then it explodes right there's yeah Yes, uh, there are people who talk about having uh, full body orgasms when they're having sex as a couple and they both have that full body orgasm and they like go out of their body 
as a result of it. And uh, very strong. yeah, uh, so all energy, all chi is sexual energy, number one. Uh, what else would I say? Okay, so uh, we know about your demons. We know about your astral travel. We know about your kundalini. So, um, um, you said you work with Archangel Michael. Did you say that really? So, uh, yeah. tell us about your interactions with him. Yeah, so um, maybe 15, 20 years ago, I had started to take an interest in angels. And um, coming from the background that I did, you know, I was closed off to like Christianity in general, but I did take my love for Jesus and the angels with me. And um, Jesus had saved me actually a lot of times from demon attacks, just calling on his name. And um, Archangel Michael was somebody I definitely had to work with because I needed his protection. And many times he would, he would, there I would be attacked by a demon. I would pray to him, and he would, he would come and take me and fly me, fly me out of the room and just take me on an adventure. And um, uh, it wasn't until about um, maybe 15 years ago I was up one morning and I thought I would just pray to him and um, this I was in a, it, I was awake so it was easy to connect with him when I was in and out of body when I was like awake like this it was it wasn't easy right so but one morning I had just got the idea to pray to him and um, it, it I barely even finished a thought of a prayer when I heard this or even felt this explosion and it was like a force field went whoop and I heard the sound it sounded just like a whoop and I was like, whoa, what was that? And then I was like, okay, let me try it one time. I was like, Archangel Michael, like, protect me. And it was just, boom, again. And so three times I prayed to him and I felt and heard this force field from within me expand outward. And I was like, whoa, okay, this is real. And um, from then on, I would just pray to him. I would pray to him every night. And um, the more I prayed and connected with him, the more his presence would be shown, the more I could feel and see um, his energy. So his gift is that he can purify you uh, with his blue flame. And so when I would pray to him, I would not necessarily see blue, but I would see golden light that would download it and into my body and I would feel it. And so when that would happen, I would pray for people and you know, ask ask them to be released of, you know, their, I guess I was praying for them to release their demons and I didn't know it. And uh, then their demons would go through me <laughs> and we'd have a battle and then they would leave and things would be good again. So, yeah, that's my experience with him. But I do connect with other angels, uh, Raphael um, and other entities like Saint Germain and um the goddess Lakshmi, she is, she's the goddess of abundance. She has shown up in ways that I can't even explain. Like she is such a force in my life and um, a lot of good things are happening right now in terms of uh, abundance. <laughs> the last uh, year, the last few weeks even, um, lots of good news financially for me, uh, just by um, connecting with her and just meditating with her every single day receiving her frequency, which is a gold, a gold coin frequency. It's actually like a golden coin frequency. I literally see it. It goes through me like um, filaments of um, golden light streams, and they just not only heal me physically, but supercharge me. And I've been able to manifest quite a few amazing um, financial abundances recently. So are you a billionaire yet? Not a billionaire, but... Uh, How about a millionaire? <laughs> hey, it's, I, I won't tell anybody anything yet, but uh, so, good good news. There's been good news for me. So and, you are you about to retire at age 44? Maybe, you know, but my spiritual work's never done. Like, I... What, it, what, I is, have, what is her name again? Tell us the lady's name. The goddess Lakshmi. Goddess Lakshmi. Tell um, us about her. Uh, she's a Hindu goddess. Um, so there's, um, I think there's like two types of Buddhism. There's like Zen Buddhism where they worship Buddha, you know, the the the, the guy from India, and then there's uh, Hindu Buddhism where they have like thousands of gods and goddesses. 
and one of them um, is uh, the goddess of abundance. Uh, her name is Lakshmi. And I became fascinated her with her in my 20s when I was broke. <laughs> I was like, hey, you know, I need some abundance. And uh, somehow I came across her and came across this med meditation uh, by this angel healer. Her name is Nadine Dossier. And uh, um, after my, I had been doing her meditation on and off for years and years, and I kind of felt stuff, but not really. But after my Kundalini awakening, I had one night where I just had this amazing meditation and this very powerful thought that I needed to do her meditation. And at that point, I hadn't done it in maybe a year. So I was like, okay, I'll do her, I'll just do her meditation. I have to do it. Turned it on, and immediately it was like, beings came into my room and operated on each of my chakras i could feel it physically it was so intense the entire time i was mixed between being completely zen calm and completely excited and just what is happening and um they worked through each of my chakras and when it got to my heart there was just like a lot like electricity and pain and like it just was the most incredible uh, experience I ever had and then um, from that point on I, I did that meditation almost every single day and um, just received insane downloads um, by doing that and um, yeah I basically could connect with her without playing that meditation I'll just could ask her to come and I immediately will start to see gold filaments downloading and I can feel them going through my body and uh, so yeah. <laughs> uh, so do, do you say that what happened when they worked on your heart was the most amazing experience of your life. You're saying that experience was more amazing than your Kundalini awakening. It almost was because it was like everything that was the person was saying on the guided meditation, it was like instantly I would feel it and it would start happening in that area of my body. And, you know, just because I had my Kundalini awakening didn't mean I was perfect. Um, there's always a process of cleansing and purifying that you have to go through. And, like, my diet wasn't it's still not perfect. So, you know, I have, uh, you, you, if you don't constantly work on, you know, raising your vibration and doing the, the energy work and the meditative work, you know, it's, stuff will start to compile. So I, I, I gather... So so what is your what is your diet? I eat everything and anything. <laughs> you, you eat you eat everything and anything. Yeah, and you know the first three months of my Kundalini awakening, my energy was so insane I could drink a whole bottle of wine and not even feel it. That's how insane it was. Um, I could eat anything, drink anything, and I was invincible. But it wasn't until after the um, energy started to settle that I started to have uh, reactions to food, where I was puking all the time, the food would not stay down, I was reacting to everything. And then um, that settled down even further. And I had I had, had all sorts of uh, health problems before the awakening, but a lot of that went away. I had allergic reactions to food. I would get all sorts of rashes. I don't, I've never had that since. Um, um, I do feel the calling to eat less meat. I do juice a lot. I do have, I think, a really good balance. Um, my body will react negatively if I eat too much sugar. I don't drink that much anymore. I, um, I am feeling the call to eat less meat, but it's difficult because I love Korean barbecue. So <laughs> it's hard. It's really hard. <laughs> so, um, okay, I got you. Uh, I'm a I'm a, a vegetarian. I the only time I ever eat meat is when my wife uh, feeds me a TV dinner that has it in there and she hasn't told me. <laughs> Short of that, I don't eat meat anymore. Uh, not to say I don't love meat. I mean, it's obviously uh, animals taste great, but uh, I just I've heard stories, horror stories about how humans treat cattle and um, and other animals. And uh, I've also read books that state that um, no matter how much humans uh, want peace, the earth will never be peaceful. There will never be a lack of war 
until we stop eating the animals. That came from the other. The book was uh, that I in question. I don't remember the book, but I just remember that was information that came from sources on the other side in the afterlife. They said this world will never be peaceful until humans stop eating animals. And, uh, yeah, you know, it's so it's when the energy moves to the higher centers, then you start. It's, it was like a curse. It was like, oh, but now now I love my whole family and I I, I need to like reach out to them because like, you know, like my, my all my relationships got healed because I had this this compassion now. And like, um, and of course, yeah, now now it's like, oh, God, now I eat an animal and I feel guilt. Right. So it's like I have the utmost respect and admiration for vegans. And I, I, I just like would love it if we could just not harm animals. And, it, and it's like this constant, like, I'm not there yet. I have a friend who had her Kundalini awakening and it was like within a matter of days or weeks, she was like off meat. And I'm like, how, you know? So I don't, I try not to be hard on myself. Um, I know I'm going to get there in time. Um, um, for whatever reason, the compassion factor isn't enough to make me stop. Um, but it's weird. Like I've noticed that the like pork. I don't eat that much pork anymore. The texture of pork makes me nauseous. The texture of meat in general kind of gets to me. But somehow I'm overriding that um, still. Um, and yeah, I'm just kind of I'm just letting it run its course. You know, just like a bad boyfriend that you know you're not supposed to be with. You just let it run its course, and then it will end eventually. <laughs> well, okay, so. Um... For breakfast, I eat uh, a bowl of uh, fruit, uh, you know, like pineapples, blackberries, blueberries, strawberries, bananas, and um, that's about it. And um, and it's you know been in the refrigerator for a while for half a day you know for however long it took my wife to make it maybe overnight so it's nice and cold and uh and it's sweet you know it's like almost like eating sugar i mean it is sugar fruit is um how do i put this in my research about diet uh i i discovered that regardless of what you eat including meat even, even if you include meat uh, it all gets turned by the body into sugar because sugar is the only thing the body can absorb. Everything else gets turned by the body into sugar and then this body absorbs it from there. So if you eat um, fruit, it's it's either it's sugar and water. And so the water, of course, is going to go out of your body uh, or m some of it gets absorbed because your body needs water. And, and there's a guy, um, I don't know if you heard about him, there's a guy who hasn't drunk in water in like 45 years, uh, ever. But he drinks juice. So that's water. In the, most of juice is water. So yeah. he's drinking a form of water, and uh, he eats only fruit. He's a fruitarian. And yeah. so I think fruit, uh, being a, um, how do I put this? The gorillas uh, are the only animal in nature that we are like. They're the only animal in nature that walks. Well, gorillas and sasquatches and other cryptids, uh, uh, if you believe in them, which I do, uh, are the only creatures that walk on two feet. And we don't know what most of those creatures eat, but. Uh, the gorillas definitely eat mostly bananas and 99, 95 to 99% bananas and a little bit of, uh, you know, green leaves here and there. So I think uh, that fruit is the natural uh, food of humans, uh, you know, as in yeah, what you're supposed to eat. Yeah, there was a period of time where my boyfriend was like, let's become fruitarians. I was like, no way. Well, you know, um, okay, so let me let me go on the rest of my diet. So uh, yeah. it was fruit for breakfast. I was eating fruit for lunch. Then I added a salad. or I was eating fruit and salad for lunch. And yeah. then 
but I'm not a very good cook. So what I did at that point was, you know, I was eating uh, fruit and salad for lunch and fruit and salad for dinner because I, I never have taken the time to learn how to cook. So at that point, uh, I finally let my wife get back in the middle of my diet. And so she's not really into cooking anymore. She spent her whole life cooking, but uh, but she has gotten old enough to where she doesn't really like doing it anymore. So, um, so I just let her pick out uh, non-meat um, uh, uh, you know, like TV dinners that are that are yeah. plant based, and yeah. that's what I eat for lunch and dinner now nowadays. And so uh, I'm I am natural for breakfast and processed for the other two meals. <laughs> now processed food is terrible, yeah. uh, but the more it the less meat, it's better, and the less uh ingredients that you don't understand what they are is better uh if you can actually see the vegetables <laughs> obviously that's a good thing yeah uh well, so go i'm a firm believer you know as, as dr joe dispenza teaches you know it, it matters what you eat but at the same time it, it matters more how you feel about what you eat so if you're constantly subconsciously cursing your food as it's going in, then it's not going to do you any good. And, you know, for me, it's like I just believe I'm invincible when I eat and it's been going OK. <laughs> but I did used to have a very bad relationship with food. I realized I used to curse my food. I used to be like, this is going to do something bad to me. And I didn't realize I was doing it, but it was it was there. It was a subtle kind of thought. As so, I, would, as I would eat, I would be like, oh, man, this is going to give me a reaction. This is I'm not, I can't have dairy. I used to think I couldn't have dairy, but now I can eat as much dairy as I want. It's fine. But back before, I was constantly thinking there was something wrong with it. So, I mean, we're all at different stages in our development, and we're all, all our bodies are different, and we all process things differently. So, you know, as much as I love and respect and admire vegans, it's like it's just not for everyone yet. But I do see in maybe over the next thousand years, you know, we're going to we'll probably need more energy than we are matter and we probably you know if enough of us do raise our kundalini and take our evolve you know our evolution to the next level then you know we probably will just absorb energy from the earth and absorb energy from the universe so have you ever heard of uh have you ever heard of uh dr douglas in graham sounds familiar <laughs> okay so he wrote a book called the 80 10 10 diet yeah, yeah yeah it's the it's the bible of vegans and um um it's 80 percent carbs uh 10 percent um protein and 10 percent um i forgot what the other 10 percent is for but you should, uh, he says, ideally, you really don't want more than five or six percent, uh, maximum 10 percent protein, yeah. um, 80 percent carbs, and uh, the other 10 percent, like I said, I forgot what that is, but uh, you might consider reading that book. It's he's got more knowledge about diet than anybody I've ever heard speak, so I would definitely recommend. Uh, 80 10 10 diet there's another book there's another diet book i would recommend um it's written by oh, hold on a second now give, give the information hold on one second uh, um this one is, all right here we go all right so I have to, in order to do this, I have to actually uh, un, I have to change my background. Okay, so uh, change background and 
and no background. There we go. There's my actual natural background. And um, OK, so here's. Here is the 801010 diet book by Douglas in Graham. There's that book. So you know what it looks like. Yeah. And um, the other one that I would recommend. Uh, is. This guy, this is. Uh, what is his name? Oh, Professor Arnold Arett. E H R E T. Uh, let me see if I can get this right. The mucusless diet uh, healing system yeah. and oh, mucusless diet. Now this guy, uh, Mr. Heret or Eret, I should say, Arnold Eret, E H R E T, Eret. Um, he died at the age of forty-five. He um, fell uh, he fell on uh he slipped on some ice hit the back of his head and it killed him at the age of 45 but um if you read about some of his fasting um he his system was about um eating it was mostly fruit fruitarian diet but it, it wasn't a strictly fruitarian diet but it was um mostly fruit and um but he alternated that with fasting yep. and i've watched a lot of youtube videos on um different types of fasting yep. and uh, have you seen any of the videos on um uh, there's a lady i can't i can't remember her name she she's really good with uh with uh, the, the the most amazing videos i've seen of hers were fruit fasts and they talk of these people who do fruit fasts uh, go through, they process a, a lot of their emotions. Uh, their repressed emotions come up during the fruit fast. And wow. those stories are absolutely amazing. And, uh, and they're transformative stories. They're pretty cool. And yeah, they're thinking of doing a fast and like, was it, like, I do know when I do like short fast, like my energy is insane. Like, Say again. When I do, I, I'm planning on doing a fast soon because when I've done some short fasts, like the energy flows like a freight train through me. It's, it's, it's so, definitely. Uh, it's so, are you familiar with the world's record for fasting? I believe there was a kid who was meditating, you know, for like over a year or something. Well, it was a. It was a, a young man and he um, he was uh, very obese and oh. he uh, he had like, I don't know, three or four hundred pounds. I don't remember what exactly his weight was, but he had an idea of what he wanted to get down to. And he, let me let me go back to my. Um, turning my background, changing it back to this. All right. So, uh, yeah, you're right. He fasted for over a year. He got yeah. down to his ideal weight, and then he ate a, I think he ate an egg and something else. I don't remember exactly how he got off of his fast. From what I hear, the the danger is not in the fast. Even uh, Arnold Arett states very clearly in his um, book that the danger is not in the fast. The fast will never kill you. It's what you eat after the fast. <laughs> if you oh, don't come off of you the fast, egg. what's that? You eat an egg coming off the fast? I don't know about that. That's well, I, I, I'm not. I don't remember exactly what he ate. I was thinking it was an egg, but it could have been literally anything. Uh, but, but uh, they have. Uh, and I'm not sure anybody's ever died from the fast itself, but a lot of people have died from uh, eating the wrong things afterwards. There's a guy who. He mentions in his book who who ate uh, a uh, whole meal of prunes after he got off his fast and he died not from the fast he died from the prune his reaction to the prunes because they had too much sugar and, and it was too sweet uh, for you don't want to eat a huge amount of sugar right after you come off of a fast 
And uh, anyway, let's get back to you. I, I just thought we would go down that road a little bit. <laughs> I know oh, that I do, you're gonna. I do you're gonna to head out soon. I, I have family coming over. Ah, there hours. we go. There we go. I didn't ask you uh, what your yeah. limit was, and since you're yeah. you do have one, we will uh, end this with um, uh, anything you wish to talk about your uh, endeavors, and um, also any other. I mean, I'd love to have you back on again for part two and. But if you've had, um, I would like to let you focus on what you're doing, what you wish to promote, and also anything else that you feel is uh, amazing enough that you feel it's something you just have to get out for the people before you leave. Uh, anything, all, all that and more that you want to compress into whatever amount of time you uh, wish to stay before you go. Sure, thanks. Um, no, I just, um, I'm going to continue, I guess, to interview people who've had near-death experiences. Um, I'm working on a project where I'm going to be featuring them a little bit more professionally and a little bit more, um, it's going to be a big, really big project. I think my life's calling. Um, in this series back to the source so stay tuned for that um but uh I, I just earlier did an interview this morning with um uh, a woman named sadie and she is hosting this uh, summit it's a grief summit where she interviews people who have dealt with grief and um it's uh, going to be airing on march 30th and i will be sharing a little bit more about that on my youtube channel um and there's going to be a ton of speakers and people talking about um, grief and, you know, overcoming grief through, I guess, spirituality and, yeah, so keep an eye out for that, and uh, that's about it. Thanks so much for having me. It's been really fun chatting with you, and I'd love to come back on. Okay, so if if you wanted, uh, let me put myself back in here, hold on. Uh, so if you wanted to tell the people something other than, you know, the obvious, like, they're part of God and they're really indestructible and they should do the best they can while they're alive. And it's a, it's a uh, important thing for them to be here at this time. You know, the obvious things, you don't need to go into that stuff, but if there's something um, that you could say that um, kind of takes what you've learned, uh, you started with um, demonic attacks at some point, you got into energy work. You uh, broke away from a cult. You learned um, to get out of your body. Then you learned how to awaken your kundalini. Then you learned how to control your kundalini. Did I, have I got you down fairly? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that's you. Uh, if you want to take all that wisdom, knowledge, and experience, roll it up into a ball and throw it at your customer, at your uh, listeners and tell them basically what to avoid and what to go for in general uh, if they want to move forward spiritually and move towards working with Archangel Michael and Christ and uh, and uh, to end your the what well, Lakshmi uh, the um, the uh, goddess and meet these beings and transform their life uh how could you roll that up into a uh, 15 second uh, <laughs> elevator speech on what to do with their life yeah, yeah um the main thing that i learned in my experience was um there is no barrier between you and the divine and there's nobody that needs to come and like attune you fix you open you you can kind of contact them directly i did it you can do it too you know, i was not born with special abilities you know things just i had to reach for it and i didn't let anybody say that i had to have a certificate or get a master to do something to me or do a course no i reached for it one-on-one -on -one, and you can too just be diligent um how expensive was Joe Dispenza's course? Uh, 
Was it expensive or? It was just over three hundred dollars U.S. I think. And is it is it still that same price? Yeah, probably. Probably, and even that, you know, people people will ask me like, you know, they'll go off and just start buying Dr. Joe's stuff, and like, where was the meditation? What week was it? And all these details, and I I tell people like, look, we're not none of we're, you're not going to have the same experience as me, and like, I had that experience because I put my all into that moment, and it just happened to be a Dr. Joe workshop. But, you know, and then I did this other experience, you know, I was in a group call and like I had my second Kundalini explosion and everybody wanted to join that meditation and do that. And I was like, OK, but, you know, just attending something like that is not going to ignite it. It's all within you. You have to put your all into this moment, you know. So I always tell people you can you don't need some external thing. You know, you just you just need to give yourself the permission to give it your all. So how long did you do energy work on yourself before you had your, you know, from the very first time you did any uh, energy work until the moment you had your Kundalini waking? How, how many years? How long was that? I'm going to say it was 15 years. Um, and my message to people who think that it's going to take that long, no, because A, I wasn't even conscious that I was doing it. B, I think the more people who there's so the more people that do it, the, the more it's in the field, the more it's in our subconscious. And I believe in people now more than ever that they will be able to do it in a fraction of the time because we're all connected and more and more people are having these kinds of experiences. So it's in there out in our global consciousness field. And so I, I believe people will do it in a fraction of the time that I did. So uh, just a few more questions. What, uh, how dangerous do you think it is to awaken the Kundalini? And not as dangerous as in it's a dangerous thing, but it dangerous as in it's going through your body. You are, you do have a, um, you know, some limitations as a human, not as many as people think, but the, there is some limitation there. What, how dangerous do you think it is in general? In other words, when I ask the question, I'm really saying, uh, you know, so many people say that, you, or the one person said that you have to prepare for it so that you can handle it, so that it doesn't yeah. drive you over the edge. So give me a little bit of feedback in that area, and then I will let you go. Okay. Well, yeah, you know, I, I, I. I'm a firm believer that if you create the circuitry along your spine, if you raise your vibration high enough, that it will naturally occur. And it is all divine timing. And if you really want a Kundalini awakening, you have to create the vessel for that energy to be able to be, to be able to handle that kind of voltage. And the best thing you can do is physically, emotionally, spiritually, start cleansing yourself. Because for me, who I, I was unknowingly preparing for that, but even with that preparation, it was very difficult for me. Um, but, you know, if you want to be consciously preparing for that, then you're going to be way better off than I was. And, um, yeah, diet does matter. Uh, cleansing emotional baggage, that matters. And, um, you know, just doing the work and med meditation is probably the best thing that you can do any form of meditation guided meditation dr joe dispensa has incredible practices to help prepare. so so you have uh, removed how many people's attaching spirits approximately um, it's hard to say maybe just give under, me a ballpark under a dozen under a dozen under a dozen Okay, yes. and so if you wanted to speak to somebody who had such things and they didn't have a they didn't have a friend like you to rip it out of them, uh, is there any advice you could give them based on your yeah. knowledge and experience? Um, prayer. Jesus, prayer. Jesus and Archangel Michael are the two forces. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't like Christians thinking they own Jesus and his authority and his power 
anybody can connect with Jesus. He's the most powerful being in, in the universe. He is as good as God, in my opinion. And um, prayer and connection to Jesus and to his angels and in, and, and in yourself, you know, having that conviction and power and knowing that you have authority over these kinds of entities. They feed off your fear. They feed off disgust. They feed off fear. They feed off um, all these lower of guilt and shame and you know all these lower vibration emotions. Um, you have the authority to overcome these. So you know I, I I would highly advise prayer. Like prayer has been so powerful in my life the last few years. You know if you pray every single day, ask Jesus, ask God, what ask a higher power. You know it's all the same source. You know Lakshmi or whatever. To me they're all the same. But if you want to fine tune it. You know, um, demon territory is Jesus territory and Archangel Michael territory. And, you know, you really connect with them and pray diligently every day that you reach for them. They'll they'll meet you halfway. Right. So uh, they can only lower their vibrations so much. You have to raise yours in order to make contact. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, you've been by far one of the most interesting people I've interviewed, and I've interviewed uh, a number of very interesting people like yourself. And you're, uh, and you are, you do look younger than your age, but for sure, no question about <laughs> Thank it. You. Uh, Thank you. I, uh, it's been a pleasure. I look forward to having you on again, and uh, you can give us more experiences with your astral travel and your interactions with the beings and anything else you want to discuss next time and i will go ahead and uh like i said i really do appreciate you being here and i look forward to seeing you again and let me stop the recording here we go